This week we've come to Devon, to the banks of the River X and the city of Exeter, surrounded by those rolling green hills so typical of Devon's landscape, with the sea a few miles downstream and the Dartmoor National Park over to our west. Virtually any view of the city is dominated by the cathedral, the origins of which go back to the 12th century. It's unquestionably one of the most beautiful of the great churches of Europe. All of that information and much else besides can be found in the pages of this book, Baedeker's Guide to Great Britain. But it's a guidebook with a rather unusual, indeed somewhat sinister history. In 1942, the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe, was preparing a series of raids on British cities of great historical and architectural importance. They said that these were reprisals for RAF attacks on Cologne and Lübeck. All the target information for the German pilots including Exeter Cathedral, came from the pages of this book. The attacks became known as the Baedeker Raids. In the early morning of the 5th of May, 1942, about 30 German aircraft dropped a thousand bombs and caused terrible destruction. Most of the bombs were incendiaries, and in the huge fires that followed, some 38 acres of the old city was totally destroyed. 1,500 houses went, six churches were reduced to rubble, and the cathedral itself suffered substantial damage. The Germans, delighted at the success of the raid, said the following day, Exeter was a jewel, we have destroyed it. Well, that turned out to be something of an overstatement. The cathedral was soon restored to its original glory. We've come to the city by invitation to take part in the 12th annual Exeter Festival. It's predominantly an arts festival, everything from street entertainers, buskers, jugglers and mime artists, through to symphony orchestras, opera and, happily for us, the Antiques Roadshow, which comes today from the Great Hall of Exeter University. So, let's join our experts with the people of Exeter. Well, she's uh, made by Copeland, of course, a um, wonderful piece of Parian sculpture. Uh, made around about the 1855-1860 period, and she's very beautiful. Does she belong to you? No, she belongs to my mother. Oh, ah, yeah. yes, and how did she acquire it? Uh, well, it came down through, it was left to her when my father died, and my uh, grandfather bought it. Um, he loved artistry, and it reminded him of, of his wife, my grandmother, when she was a young you girl. The, the figure reminded me. <laughs> <laughs> I think she's very, very beautiful. She is. Wonderful. And she's cradling a little doll, which I think is rather nice. And now worth about uh, a couple of hundred pounds, perhaps a, a little bit more. Lovely style. And these are a lovely pair of vases. The, these are also um, from your grandmother, from grandmother, are they? Yes. Grandmother, yes. yes. And these are your mother's yes. now. Yes, I think they they're are. lovely. A pair of Royal Worcester, of course made in 1917, um, with the date codes on them. Uh -huh. And they're spill vases, uh, ornamental spill vases, to stand on the mantelpiece. And I think they're very beautiful. They're going to be worth around about um, six, seven hundred pounds, the, the two of them says. Oh, That's gosh. jolly nice indeed. <laughs> and this very handsome figure of, um, uh, is it St George of the it's Dragon? St George, yes. I think he's absolutely marvellous, isn't he? Do you, do you like that? I love it. I, it's been a great favourite of mine since I was a, a very small. Yes, He's so it's been, been through the family again. Yes, my, my, my grandmother bought it. Um, yes, this is the same grandmother, the same grandmother who is this one. This is, this is grandmother. She was, 80. <laughs> was told that she couldn't have it, it was too expensive. Who told her that? My father and my aunt. They Did said, they? She'd seen it in a shop and <laughs> they said, no, don't be silly, it's far too expensive. So they went off to business and it's a custom at the end of the day to go in and join her for drinks in the evening. And apparently that the next day she had hired a car, come over to Sidmouth to buy it, took it back and sort of said, well, fait accompli, there it is. I wanted it, I'm having it. Good for her. <laughs> Do you know what she paid for it back then? I think it was about 90 pounds. Because so she bought it brand new I believe at so, 90 yes. pounds. It's modeled by a man called Thorogood and um, it's a very splendid horse and a very splendid rider. And the coloring is spectacular. Is, isn't it? And nowadays, I suppose the value is going to be somewhere between about six and 800 pounds. So her 90 pounds has proved a very good investment. <laughs> and more particularly, she enjoyed it. You enjoyed it. And I certainly do, yes. That's fine. Where do you keep it? At the moment, it's in our sun lounge. But when I was growing up, it was in the hall and used as a hat stand, actually. One would come in, put the hats on the heads and the coats across the middle. <laughs> um, do you know who it was made? No, I think it's Chinese, but I'm not sure. There's an inscription here and there's yeah. another little tiny plaque there. Right. But okay. I really don't know. 
much okay. more about it. Well, let's get the country of origin um, set. It was actually made in Japan. Oh. And funny enough, it was a bronze, really, that, that came out of a, a sort of a period of recession. Because up until the late sort of 1860s, the Japanese metalwork industry was pretty well firmly based upon one major client, and they were the samurai. And then there was an edict passed in the late 1860s by the emperor saying that the Japanese samurai were no longer allowed to wear their swords in public. So all of a sudden, all these metal workers were sort of redundant. redundant. Yeah. So they were sort of plunged into a an eight, late 1860s recession. So they had to turn the hand to a you know to a different type of metalwork industry, and a lot of them turned to producing bronzes. And when it comes to date, actually, this actually dates from a little bit later. We're talking in terms of around about 1890, 1900. Uh, the thing I like about the Japanese bronzes of this period is their, their attention to detail. Um, as you can see, there was a, there were, in Japan at this time, there was women had equality. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, certainly, certainly his wife. I mean, it may be his wife. I don't know. It may be his daughter. But here they are, obviously, um, plowing a sort of a, a paddy field, field yeah. uh, because I'm pretty sure you, you can see the way that his feet disappear disappears into the mud. I, I've got a feeling that that it's probably the work of a top um, Japanese uh, sculptor called Seiya. Um, it's more of a hunch um, than, uh, than, than a guess. Um, but obviously the sort of thing was made for the European market because... Well, my great uncle, as far as I know, bought it. And he bought it when? Can you remember? Well, it's over 75 he... years ago, right, to my so knowledge. Turn of the I, yes. Did he, did he ever relate how much he had to part with? Title? No, I don't know any more about it, but he bought it and he gave it to my parents. Right. And, he and this, I think, was made this as, as the stand for it. Yes, I, I, I think he possibly had it made. I don't know whether it came with no, the... No, I think it actually came with the stand, quite no. frankly. It, it, it's in a, um, a type of wood that you often find uh, Japanese furniture oh. and Chinese furniture. And so oh, that's they, interesting. the base looks as though it's contemporary with it. Oh, thank you. Um, that being said, have you, got it? Have you got the thing insured or anything like that? Has anybody ever, you know, put a value on your hat stand? About £3,000, we thought. Mm. To be honest, I think you would, get, you would do far, far better than that at auction, because I can see an object like this at auction being worth at least um, six to perhaps £9,000. So I'd just like to thank you for bringing in what has to be, you know, the most upmarket hat stand I think I've ever seen on the Antiques Roadshow. If I said it was um, 250 years old, would that surprise you? Yes, it would surprise me. Mm. Well, it was made in Staffordshire in the middle of the 18th century and is an example of what's called salt glazed stoneware. Decorated in coloured enamels in the Chinese style and particularly you can see the uh, influence of the Chinese family rose decoration, this pink here, but you would never see in China or almost anywhere else this wonderful translucent turquoise. Look how thick it is there. You see? Yes. Lovely great lumps of it. Typical also uh, of this kind of pot of a crab stock uh, spout and handle, and which again is echoed on the finial. Now, of course, it, it has been like slightly nibbled round here, uh, but most of the pieces of this kind you see are in much worse condition than this. And it is an extreme and nice pot. So you've never had it valued? No. Well, I think you should insure it for about two thousand pounds. Really? Mm. Really? No. Mm. I'd like you to tell me, have all the children in your family slept in this cradle? Our own three children have slept in it, and my husband and his brother before him slept in it. So it's been in the family for quite some time? Since 1941, my husband's parents bought it then for six pounds in Derbyshire on their honeymoon. With anticipating having yes, a family? indeed. <laughs> it may come as a bit of a shock for me to say that I don't think it started life as a cradle. My theory is that it started life as a chest, a 17th century chest, and the style of the whole cradle is very much of the 17th century. The first thing that you notice about it is, is that. It's oak, it's frame and panel construction, and it has all the uh, 
diamond-shaped decoration, the relatively crude flower carvings that one would associate with that sort of period. It also got this wonderful uh, roof to it. And what this particular hood reminds me of is the, the architectural furniture of William Burgess, who was an extremely important and interesting designer in the uh, 1860s. And there are certain things about this cradle that, for me, suggest that in the last two decades or so of the 19th century, it has been altered from a 17th century chest. And partly it's because of this hood, and it's also partly because of the use on the rockers and on the back of inscriptions, of mottos. And here, in fact, we've got uh, sweet sleep, my dear, your mother guards you here. And it's not quite 17th century language. The, the lettering, the style of the lettering, too, is uh, much more characteristic of the late 19th century. Uh, for, for purists, perhaps, um, it, it would not be worth as much money. For me, it's worth almost more because of its, its richness of association. And I think probably in, in the auction house, uh, 1,000 to 1,500, something like that. <laughs> I didn't expect as so much as that. Thank you. Well, this is a, a bit of a motley folder, isn't it? It is, yes. <laughs> what, a whole lot of things in here. Prints, watercolours, a real, a real mixed bag. What's a, what, where do you get these? I bought them at a boot sale. A boot sale? A boot sale. A boot sale. Um, I mean, this is rather fascinating. This is uh, the Bachelor's Fancy Ball at Exeter on the 14th of January, 1835. Yes. They certainly like dressing up in those they days, do. didn't they? Oh, yes. You'll see fairly wild life in Exeter th at that they point. Enjoyed but that's a, that's a rather nice hand coloured print there, and a good piece of uh, local history. And this is really rather good, this one. This is, this is actually, these are not prints, these are watercolours. Yes. And I see they're both signed Pauline Walker. Walker. I hardly dare ask you um, what you paid for it. I paid five pounds for the lot. What? For the lot? For the lot. What, recently? Yes. How amazing, because uh, I, mean, I would have thought these, these drawings alone must be worth um, 80 to 120 pounds each. Was it something you've inherited or did you buy it? No, I inherited it, but it was given to me when I was a child. So you were able to use it? Some time ago, and I've used it all my life. Oh, isn't that lovely? Mm. Well, I tell you what makes it special is because it's made of yew wood, and if you can see the colour of the wood, it's a lovely sort of soft, almost pinky colour. And it's got this romantic scene of a church, ruined church, and the marquetry is just highlighted with a little bit of penwork, if you can see round here. There are, there are shamrock leaves round the front. Oh, and and this, box, this box was made in uh, Killarney in southwest Ireland. Did you oh, know that? That's curious. No, I didn't know that. And it's something that I haven't seen very often, and, and the fact it's you would is really nice, but they're not common. And, uh, I would put a value of about four to six hundred pounds. That seems a lot. Well, a nice little thing. Well, it's it's um, it's a, you know it's a, you know what it is. It's a jolly nice thing. It's a dessert stand. Unfortunately, they've absolutely cracked the marks in here so much so that it's broken there, and they've soldered it up. And the mark, the actual date letter, is now unreadable. But it's about 1630. It's made, I think, by a chap called Thomas Maddox who made a load of these dessert stands in the 1620s, 30s, and very early 40s. They're not dramatically rare, but they're very, very pretty. Um, and as you can see, it's had a bit of a hard life. There's a, a break there, there's another restoration there. They did, t they're quite thin, and it does tend to go, they're but... They're not servant-proof. They're not servant-proof, <laughs> absolutely right. Just exactly that. But it's. You know, it's a, it's a lovely thing, about 1630, and worth, I suppose, um, well, in that condition, about four to five thousand pounds, something, something along that line. But um, it is, you know, it's, no. Well, I, I mean, I would be very disappointed if she wanted to sell it. I mean, it's a lovely thing. Do you know all these? Um, yes, you might children? think that there were a number of girls there, but in fact, there's only one girl, only one which girl. is my great aunt Lotta. Yes. That is my grandfather. Yes. This boy became canon in the Falklands. This boy was killed in the Jameson Raid in South Africa. But this is the one we're interested in, oh, Shirley yes. Aspinall, who showed artistic promise who quite showed, early. What was his name? Shirley Aspinall. Shirley Aspinall, yes. right. Not only a painter, 
He was a gifted musician and a mimic. In fact, he was commanded to give a concert to Queen Victoria in Osborne. Really? But uh, unfortunately, his lifestyle was bohemian. Was uh, <laughs> well, as <laughs> fits an artist. <laughs> and, uh, because yes. I think this is actually a work by Shirley Aspinall that you've also brought it. His last I'm work. Sure. Yes. His last work. Yes. Um, yep, here it is, signed down here. Um, G.S. Aspinall, 1889, which would all fit in because uh, in the previous picture he was a boy yes. and it was 1859. But this is him as an artist and really quite an accomplished artist, I think, isn't he? Yes. And was uh, still life particularly his thing? Flowers? Um, no, he uh, painted a number of landscapes. Did landscapes as well. Because he's watercolour in Italy and in Wales. Really, uh, really. We have some of his. Because this is actually an extremely accomplished piece of flower painting. I suppose that a um, still, big still life like this could be worth somewhere perhaps between two and a half, three and a half thousand pounds, Very that nice. sort of yes. thing. And then there's this second picture behind, the wonderful portrait. Well, that's something that, uh, of course, I'm sure you'd never dream of selling, but I suppose that if it came up at auction, you could quite possibly get something between six and eight thousand pounds for it. Really, that's wonderful. Very lovely thing. Have you ever opened this or not? No, I haven't. Never? My husband, my husband has, but I Well, I this is English watchmaking at its finest. A beautiful engraved, pierced and engraved balance cock with a diamond end stone. And the man's name is Rewalling of London. Now, looking at that movement, I would have said it's about 1735. But the hallmark, which is in here, is very much later, 1793, in fact, from London. Mm -hmm. So that tells us that that lovely movement has been recased in there, and it really is super. So let's move on to the next one. Would you use it as a sugar, sugar bowl? No, 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 it's a pound pot. It's all right, because it's not worth much. Now this is rather super, isn't it? This, this is enormous. It's yes. um, got cows and uh, milk and cream and everything on the outside. And uh, what is, is this for clotted cream? Oh no, it's no. For milk. And these are the bearers for the two measures. Yeah. Of course uh -huh. they used to sell it with little metal yeah. measures. It's and, stood um, on the counter in the dairy. I yeah. don't know who made it, the month of Sundays, but I, I think it's absolutely wonderful. Crikey, anybody would give the ears for it. It's very impressive. Yeah. It's wonderful. What's it worth? I don't know. What are you prepared to give or take for it? I, would, I wouldn't take anything for it. I mean, I wouldn't sell it. No, I know. But I suppose if something like that came on the auction market, I mean, it could well go for something like £500. Do you think so? Yes. Oh, what I should have said, and you probably also know, that plunging that I don't quite understand it's, what they're Well, it's a quarter pushing. repeater. That's actually running far too fast, but it strikes the preceding quarter. So at two o'clock, no, it will go ding, ding, and then at, say, quarter past two, it will go ding, ding, and then ding, dong, like that. Look at that. Lovely, lovely continental watch. A tiny baby balance cock. And there is the top bell, under which will be another smaller bell for the repetition. Oh, so. so a superb example roughly in date about 1800 to 1810 but what um, a shame is it about french i think it's definitely french it wasn't signed but no definitely french what have you got over there got this is obviously the nicest thing one. <laughs> you kept till last yes ah it's just lovely little. now that is absolutely magnificent do you know anything about that at all or not no not at all well it looks very English to me. Let's have a peep inside. Lifting up that lid, there is the most delightful dial, absolutely exquisite, with a scene in the centre of the chapter ring, a little uh, rural scene with a church just there on the right. And uh, do you know how to tell the time with this one? No, it only seems to have one hand. You're absolutely right. It, it only has got one hand and you tell the time obviously at this end with the little heart-shaped tip on the silver chapter ring. Let's just have a peek inside. Uh, it's, it's lovely. 
It's signed by a man called Bouquet, and I see that he signed it Bouquet Londres. Well, David Bouquet was a watchmaker who came across from France in the early part of the 17th century and worked in London. He had a son called David who also had uh, various other people in the, in the Bouquet clockmaking family, but I think this is David the father. Just have a look how exquisite the piercing and the engraving is on the balance cock here. You've got the table and the foot almost the same size, beautifully pierced with flowers. And then on the ratchet setting up for the barrel, again, wonderful piercing. As I say, English, about 1630, 1640. And I'm sure that you've had a good look at the silver engraving around the band with flowers and little cherubs. Yes. It is quite, yes. quite lovely. So, Do you think it works? I see no reason why it shouldn't. It looks clean and good inside. Yes. So let's run through a few values just to make sure that your insurance is up to date. This uh, English gold Chamblet Vidal watch, I think you should insure for about two and a half thousand. This watch, I think you should think in terms of six to seven thousand on that. And this one is absolutely lovely. And if you ask me to go out and replace it for you tomorrow, <laughs> I'd actually have quite a lot of difficulty. I think at least ten to twelve thousand on your insurance. All right, thank okay. you very much. Well, you know, we could hardly come here to Devon and to Exeter in particular without seeing at least a couple of examples of the marvellous silver that was made and assayed here in Exeter over a period of some 300 years or so. And two pieces have been kindly loaned to us by the Royal Albert Memorial Museum. And I gather that this uh, spoon is not the first time you've seen it, Brand. No, indeed it's not. I, I think it is one of the most important English spoons to exist. I think I offered a thousand pounds for it over 20 years ago and today heaven knows but I still want it desperately. It's made almost certainly from Devon silver, silver from the Coombe Martin mines which is on the north coast mm -hmm. because it was made for a chap called John Gilbert who then gave it to his son uh, Adrian Gilbert in 1596 and he owned the Coombe Martin mines. It's, it is the squirrel top here is absolutely unique in English silver. And valued in, in five figures today. Yes, I would give whatever I had. <laughs> and the communion cup. The Exeter communion cups of the 1570s and 80s are the only ones that have this extraordinary bulge and then slight kick in here. There's nothing like it. Always, always Exeter. If you feel that sort of little bump and ride there, you know it's going to be an Exeter uh, communion cup. This one was made by Richard Hilliard in Exeter about 1575 and he is a, was a very famous Exeter goldsmith but equally famous as the father of Nicholas Hilliard, the, uh, the, the miniature, yes, the great miniaturist to, to Elizabeth and James I. That is one of the great communion cups of the country and made down here. That is one of the finest spoons you'll ever see made here, not in London. And it's very, very, very exciting to see two wonderful examples marvellous pot. How did you come to have a piece with the arms of Trinity College Cambridge? It was given to me by my father and he, the story goes that he had it made for him by Josiah Wedgwood when they were both at college together. Um, when was your father up there? Well I'm not absolutely sure. He died in, uh, at the age of 80 in 1972, so it would be somewhere before the First World War. Well, just the period just before the First World War, funnily enough, my great-grandfather was master of Trinity College, Cambridge, so he really? would have been, your father would be one of his pupils in acquiring this thing, commemorating uh, his time at, at the college and his friendship with Josiah Wedgwood, the then Josiah Wedgwood of that generation. Um, I think it's an extremely difficult thing to value. It's very beautiful. I would have thought that it's worth to somebody connected with the college three to five hundred pounds. This one, I have a feeling um, that this is not right. I think no. she's been put onto another body. The dress um, doesn't quite fit properly. It's a lovely so dress. It's yes, probably it's really the right dress of the yes. period. 
and um, she's got this really nice painting and, and very nicely painted over the papier-mâché to give her this blushed cheeks. Yes. So I would see her making somewhere around um, probably 600 to 800 pounds at all. Really? Oh, lovely. <laughs> Great. You didn't think she <laughs> no, was I didn't think she was worth it. as much as that. No, I didn't. No. It's quite a glamorous yes. piece, isn't it? Well, do you know what it is? I don't know. Well, it's one of the rarest figures or groups that I've seen on the, on the series of programmes I've been doing for some years. And uh, one gets a lot of 18th century stuff, but rarely do you get good 19th century English figures. This is made in what is called the Rococo style, revived, neo-Rococo. And so you have these costumes are done with very elaborate um, flower decoration on them, quite sumptuous, almost over, over much on, on them. Everything, every single inch of porcelain is decorated in some way or other. This kind of richness, combined with stiffness, is, is, is symptomatic or typical of the 1830s. This one was done around 1835. So on the market, a thing even damaged, one would allow for the fact that there's a little chip here, yes. a little chip there. It's still, to my mind, worth at least, what, 1,500, 2,000 pounds. It could, in mint condition, maybe more, but it's a marvellous object. Thank you very much. Right. Well, it's nice to have something nearly local here. You come from local, from locally? Up on the moor. Up on the moors? Yeah. Dom. And you know all about the Newlyn School, I suppose? No. Don't you? No. Oh, well, this is, uh, this is uh, Cornwall. This is Newlyn. And uh, Harold Harvey was one of the, the gang of artists. He was a bit younger than the rest, born in uh, uh, 1874, whereas the Newlyn School started not long after he was born. I, I, th I think it's a smashing example. And it's just on the wall, is it? Yes, it's not actually Enjoy. anywhere special. Yes, yes. I can't say I love it. <laughs> I don't, I, I don't. It. Anyway, yeah. uh, I think it's a very good example. And as, as such, even though it's not large, I think it's worth seven to nine thousand pounds. How much? Seven to nine thousand. Not seven to nine. Yes, no, not seven to nine thousand. <laughs> Between seven and nine thousand pounds. That's still. Gosh. It's a lovely picture, isn't it? <laughs> Gosh. This horse is a pug. Uh, what do people say when they come into your home and they see it? I'm just. I don't. I just like. Well, to know. most people think it's absolutely hideous, but do they? I, I mean, I'm very fond of it. I was brought up with it, and I used to play with the prayer wheel, and I'm afraid the tassels have come to rather... Yes, it's usually the way. Yeah. Well, let's, let's have a look at it from a, from a construction point of view, shall we? Let's start with this amazing drawer, with this wonderful roundel. Again, a central medallion, and this outer frieze, this wonderful sort of design. Purely fanciful is, you don't find this type of... It's, it's not, it's not Arab, Arab in any shape, or Moorish. Um, this is Mr. Carlo Bugatti, and if the name sounds familiar to anybody, it's probably not so much because of Carlo, but his son, Ettore, who was the, the famous uh, racing car designer during the 1920s. So there is a connection. And then we come to this sort of curious sort of inlay, which is, again, metal, uh, but in the form of a bamboo branch, isn't it? Yes. Or, or, or a grass, which is very much a, a Japanese influence. I say date-wise around about 1895 and at that time uh, in Italy um, because he was based in Milan um, Italian decorative arts were going through a funny phase and I know for a fact that um, when this um, furniture was shown at the Paris exhibition of 1900 people just scratched their heads they thought it was bizarre and curious to say the very least so in some respects, he was a little bit in advance on his contemporaries. And then moving over to my right, it's a weird and wonderful looking thing. What do you call it? Well, it's a prayer wheel, I think. Well, it does look like a prayer wheel, uh, doesn't it? That, but that's what I I'd always... expect a prayer wheel to turn up in Tibet or Tibetan well. furniture. And then, um, I suppose you might call it a sort of a crowning glory, the tower. It's, a, it's almost sort of a, a minaret type thing, isn't it? With this, this, these lovely uh, columns, and this, this wonderful arch, and again, this very, very stylistic inlay, again in metals, brass and silver, uh, and again, you know, quite far removed from Moorish architecture. Um, 
I would have to recommend that you insure a piece like this for at least £12,000. <laughs> and did you make this collection of autograph letters? No, I didn't. Um, they were uh, collected, I think, by my great-great-grandfather and have been in the family since then. But most of these letters here, I mean, your great-great-grandfather, I would have thought they all date from the sort of mid uh, 19th century, mid to late 19th century, I would imagine that he possibly collected them virtually while the people were still alive. Yes, I think he did. I mean, we've got a wonderful letter here by one of Exeter's most famous visitors, uh, Charles Dickens here, um, from Gads Hill Place, his uh, wonderful uh, house overlooking Rochester, or in the heights of, on the heights of Rochester. Um, Dear Sir, on returning from the seaside, I find your note. And he goes on to this unfortunate chap, I cannot, however, accept the position you offer me. Dickens, at this stage, 1864, uh, at the height of his fame, um, was being offered many jobs all the time, so he had an enormous amount of trouble keeping up the work he had. Then, this one, I know, I mean, this is very uh, distinctive and obvious. Uh, Gladstone, who was a prime minister, the date on this one is uh, 1853, um, the 11th of April, 1853. So in 1853, Gladstone was still, uh, I think he was Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. Very typical Gladstone. Gladstone wrote most of his letters himself and took great pains to do so. Um, and then, which caught my eye at the end here, which I've saved the best till last, are these two. And they're both written, as you can see, in an absolute panic, an absolute hurry. And they're all signed, they're both signed, both by the same person. They're both signed D. This is Disraeli, and this is an early signature of Disraeli's, or an early monogram of Disraeli's. And it starts off, dearest. So I'm, obviously, anybody who's interested in this sort of thing would think how very exciting. Dearest, it's obviously to a lady. The excitement is at the highest. The galleries filled at noon. This is from the House of Commons, of course, and the papers are absolutely uh, um, full of the news. He goes on um, about various things. I've briefly read it through. I'm afraid his writing is, as you can see, in an absolute frenzy. Yes. He must have been writing very excitedly. The next letter, which I would imagine was written afterwards, starts, Dearest Love, and again it goes on. It mentions various um, things about Ireland, and the Irish, um, and it goes on for, an, again, another four pages, Aylesbury Affair, and so on. And at the end, signed with an even more elaborate Dizzy um, D there. Now then, have you thought of any of them for um, replacement value or insurance value? No, not really. I, I didn't know really what they were. <laughs> <laughs> well, these days, there is quite a fad uh, for Disraeli. I think those two letters there, with their excitement that he conveys to the reader, I would value those at about £750 for the pair. Good old Gladstone, well, he wrote to everybody. He was uh, an amazing man, as I said, taking a lot of time to write and writing at length. Um, his letters are quite common, but as Chancellor of the Exchequer, I suppose about £40. And then Dickens, a very nice, although it doesn't say very much, it's a very typical letter from Dickens, um, very attractive. I would imagine you could replace that for about £500. But altogether, a wonderful collection to start with. I hope you go on. Do you think they're silk? No, I don't think no, so. I've always thought it was paper. Let's just make sure. Definitely paper. It's definitely paper. No. Do you think they're and English? No, I think they're French. That's, That's what my wife said, yeah. Well, how... Yeah. Have you had them long? They belonged to my, my grandmother, and there were six of them. And when she uh, died, I think I know where they are, but they were distributed in Split. pairs uh, around what the family. Shame. Yes. What a shame. Yeah. Um, you're going to have to do a bit about this frame, yes. which has been um, woodworm. It's got quite a lot of woodworm we, we in it. We have woodwormed it. But you have? Yes. Oh, well, that's all right. It's all repaired, I think. Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, they're so decorative and, and they're rare, they're early, about 1800 French. Um, I suppose at auction we'll be talking about £200 for the pair, which doesn't seem very much, but in a way they haven't got very much colour to them. No, no. So they're interesting rather yes. than yes, very, very yes. decorative. I do understand, yes. yes. I, I love them, so I think I. they're yes. charming. That is probably the finest Champlevet enamel carriage clock 
that I've seen in some years. It's of the largest size of carriage clock, made commercially for export. Have you any idea where it was made? No idea. No. I presume it's French, but... Yeah. So if we have a look under the case here, and it in fact says on glaze. Now that should give us a clue to the market that it was made mm. for. It was in fact mm. made in France. And uh, you'd be half right in thinking that that indicates that it was made for the English market. Um, that particular reference is to the style of the handle, in fact. That is the on glaze oh. type of handle. Now, if we come to the clock itself, the Champlevé enamel pillars here are particularly spectacular. But for me, the most stunning part is the dial. The enamelling there still retained all of its colours. It really is a very beautiful piece. It's probably been contained in that case for most, if not all, of its life. And as a clock, it has a repeating mechanism, and it sounds the hours on the gong and the half hours too. Have you had it for very long? Um, I remember it as a child. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand my father had it from an uncle. So it's been around the family yeah, for some yeah, years. Yes. If we were to look at this in today's climate, in today's market, you'd probably have to pay somewhere in the region of £3,500 for that job. Cool. That's certainly more than I thought it was. That's made my day. <laughs> <laughs> it was presented to uh, a naval school, the Stubbington House School, uh, we don't know when, but it was presented by a Major Alexander in memory of his brother, and there's a little plaque on the side saying that. Oh, yes. In 1963, the school closed <laughs> down, and the uh, contents were auctioned off, and uh, my mother purchased it at that stage. Well, it's very beautifully carved, and it, it looks like a, a French third-rate uh, ship of the line. And the French prisoners of war, of course, in the Napoleonic periods, made models of their own boats, the boats that they were most familiar with. And they actually made quite a lot of money from making boats like this. And they didn't just make ships, of course, they made all sorts of other toys as well. These would have been sold at the markets at anything between about 25, perhaps, and 40 pounds. And if you realize that in about 1800, 50 pounds or 40 pounds would have kept a man very reasonably for a year. You can imagine that it was really quite a profitable exercise. And I'd like to have a look at the stern, if I may. So there's a name on the back here. Sempere. Well, I don't know, I don't know of any boat called Sempere, but I do know a boat called Sanpere, which was I mean, that was a, a very, very famous boat, and I just wonder if um, perhaps we've got a touch of illiteracy here. The Sanpere was, was won, it was a prize that was, was won at the Battle of the Glorious First, uh, the 1st of June in uh, 1794, and it then became Lord Seymour's flagship. But the most interesting thing of all is that in the turn of the century, in the early 19th century, it became a prison ship off Plymouth. So. Doesn't it seem likely that this was made by a French prisoner of war on, on the Saint Parade off Plymouth? One would like to think so. What do you particularly like about it? Any particular features that you think are, are really outstanding? After we bought it, we, uh, my mother had it re-rigged by uh, an, an ex-naval captain. Yes. Um, and it wasn't until he was working on it, he discovered that there was a mechanism for running the the guns back, which is oh, this is string Absolutely. at the back. Now, does uh, it still work? Yes, we, we don't like to pull it too hard. But, okay, let um, me give it a, a go. Oh, yes, 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 yes. They're retracting, and out they come again. Wonderful. And that could only have been done by a sailor who really knew what a, a proper sailing ship was all about. I mean, if you look in there, you've got... Uh, here you've got the chimneys that are coming up from the, the ship's kitchens. You've got the capstan and the companion ladder and the hatch covers and the gratings. Everything is there. I mean, it is not absolutely to scale. Of course, you couldn't expect it to be. Um, it's terrific. How do you keep it now so that um, 
people we, can't be tempted to fiddle with it. We had a glass case made for it, yeah. so, uh, and it's fairly high up, so mm. it's, it's safe. Mm. Well, value. It was bought by your mother, you said, in yes. 1963. Are you going to tell me how much she paid? Uh, we can't remember exactly, but it was just under £100. Mm. Well, it would be worth a significant figure above that now. I think uh, if it went into auction, we'd be talking about perhaps up to 15,000. It is absolutely terrific. It belonged to my great-grandfather. Um, he won some money in a raffle, and with the money that he won in a raffle, um, he went uh, and bought this painting. And I think I'm right in saying, according to my mother, that he paid 30 pounds for it. Would that, do you think that would have been about this period, 1870? Or? Uh, I believe so, just probably a little later than that. Yes, probably bought it as a new painting. Yes. Thing. Yes. J.J.W., John James Wilson, famous marine artist. It's a, it's a rather wonderful view of the, the Firth of Forth, isn't it? I and believe so, yes. yes. The, the lobster pot. Would that, would that possibly be uh, sort of like a painter's trademark? Would he have uh, portrayed that in, in other of his paintings? No, I don't no. think so. No, 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 not at all. No, it is, it's, it's a compositional trick, if you like. Right. I mean, making the lines flow through the picture, and you can see this line here, and it takes your... All these things, the line of birds, takes your eye up to the landscape, down, round through the pier, and, and, and artists think very carefully about these things because you can't have a flat landscape. You must travel around it, your eye must travel around it. Uh, so th that's really what it is, and it's placed there for a very specific purpose. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, it's hard to come by really top quality Victorian pictures of this type now, so I think I would value it at around 15, 20,000 pounds. Really? I'm very surprised. Well, a very good day for our experts here in Exeter, particularly Hillary, who was delighted earlier on to find that French prisoner of war model ship. Inevitably, however, there were some disappointments, which brings me to this picture brought in, wrapped in a rather grubby dustbin liner earlier today by a woman who took it over to Peter Nahum, who made the point that unfortunately it wasn't an original work of art, but a print. However, he said it was still very decorative. She was not convinced because a little while after she left the hall, a local policewoman came in with the picture, which she discovered wrapped up again in the old bin liner, thrown away contemptuously in a hedge behind the hall. I don't think it's really as bad as that, do you? Well, one thing is for certain, and that is that we'll be back at the same time next week when we're taking the roadshow to Worcestershire. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. The Antiques Roadshow regrets it cannot give any valuations by post.